Welcome, Dr. Haddad. Um, it's great to speak with you. Let's start with a brief introduction. Um, Dr. Alex Haddad is a physician, philosopher, educator, and innovator. He is a pioneer of evidence-based medicine, end-of-life care, and a digital health, and, a, and the creator of the renowned Haddad Scale, the most widely used tool to assess clinical trials. He is also the co-author with his philosopher, researcher, and entrepreneur daughter, Tamen Haddad Garcia, of the book, Healthy No Matter What which we are strongly recommending today. This book is a provocative guide that teaches you how to take control of your own health, no matter your age or circumstances. It takes you to a peek behind many curtains, giving you access to places traditionally reserved for insiders. It is packed with evidence-based insights and tools to help you achieve a healthy and long life even with serious diseases, using the latest scientific knowledge and insights from medicine, psychology, and sociology. So welcome, Dr. Haddad. This is a pleasure to have you with us. Um, Thank you very much. Well, we are so excited to talk about this book. Um, we are strongly recommending it today. It is um, the one of the best parts of literature that we've read, science-based, and um, it gives us a whole picture on what uh, our healthy lifestyle is about. And so we wanted to actually n n sort of try and find out what sparked your curiosity about such a broad topic as health. Hey, um, it really began in 2008 when I became a patient in my own hospital. Fascinating to find yourself being tested and, and treated by, by your own colleagues and to see things from the other side. So I had a possible diagnosis of cancer, of colon cancer at the time, and I was getting all sorts of tests. And when I was recovering from one of them, uh, somehow a question came to me, which sounded very crazy at the time. And the question was, could I have cancer and be healthy at the same time? Hey, I heard that inside my head. I said, what a, what a silly question. Until I realized that there was a lot in that question. And the most important thing was that even though I had gone to medical school, I had studied and worked as a professor at many uh, of the most important universities in the world. And in fact, I had jobs with health in the title. I did not know what being healthy meant, or even worse, I didn't know what health should mean to us. So fortunately, the cancer uh, was uh, ruled out, but the questions stayed with me. Of course, and I can imagine how challenging that must have been. And how did you finally define health? Well, as, as, as the question persisted, it was there all the time, I managed to, to poke a lot of people and a lot of organizations, uh, including the World Health Organization, that same year in, in 2008. And as a result of that, the British Medical Journal, which is one of the most important scientific publications in medicine in the world, uh, invited me to... Uh, poke the rest of the world <laughs> and to lead a global conversation on the meaning of health. So for three years, for three years, people from more than 50 countries, some of the most prominent thought leaders in the world and major communities joined this effort to figure out together what we should mean by health. And, and our starting point was that it was clear that the definition of health that we had at the time was wrong. And that was one that the World Health Organization had proposed in 1948 when it was founded. And, and basically this definition uh, focuses uh, on health as a state. Okay? It says health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not just the absence of disease oh. or infirmity. And, and, and I'm saying that it's wrong because it is practically impossible to be healthy if you need to have complete physical, mental, 
and social well-being. Even if you want to go to the bathroom, you don't have complete, uh, uh, you see, well-being. If you're worried about money or about a family member, you cannot be healthy. Okay? So throughout this conversation, which took, took three years, a group in the Netherlands decided to bring together the people who had made the most important contributions during this global dialogue. And what resulted from that was a completely fresh look at health that views health as an ability, the ability to adapt to the inevitable physical, psychological, or social challenges that we face throughout our lives. So health as an ability and as the ability to adapt. Oh, it's great. I mean, it, that that ability takes a lot into account the resilience of the patient, I'm guessing. And did you take into consideration also cognitive health as part of this overall definition? Well, not only we took into consideration cognitive health, is that the health as, an, as the ability to adapt is the product of our cognitive functions. Of course. So health, to a large extent, ends up depending on our cognitive okay, functioning. Yeah. And this, is, this is crucial because if we, if we think of adaptability, the ability to adapt, well, we need to, to, to judge whether we are adapting or not. And, uh, and if we are adapting, it, it would be very valuable to, to notice what we are doing to adapt and to remember what we have done that has worked and to be able to make decisions you see, that would help us to continue to be adapting. So cognition is central to this, to this new approach uh, to health and opens many, many, many possibilities to learn see, new skills on how to, to adapt, to recognize threats that are limiting our capacity to adapt, to connect with others and to relate to others, to pay attention. Hmm. All these cognitive processes are essential to a healthy life. A healthy life. Oh, very, very interesting. And also, um, your book shows that only 10% of what is needed for a healthy life is found within the medical or health care system. How could you tell us, could you tell us more about this and what is behind the other 90 if only 10% is based on our health care? Well, I think at this point it's crucial to, to, to make a very important uh, observation. And it's that we have a surprisingly powerful way to determine whether we are healthy or not. And this is Thanks to one question, one question, it takes about five seconds to answer it. And it's called the self-reported health question. And it goes as follows. In general, and by the way, I would really appreciate if you or anybody who is watching us now uh, goes through this exercise, which is a cognitive one, you see. Mm -hmm. In general, would you rate your health as poor, fair, good, very good, or excellent? So it's a self-assessment. In general, yeah, it's a self-assessment of health. And it's incredibly powerful because if you say my health is poor or fair, that means you have a negative level of health. And if you say my health is good, very good or excellent, you say that your health is positive. And, 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 and look at this. A, a, a paper, a, a research study published in 2022 that included more than 700,000 people in the US who had been followed for decades discovered that if you say that your health is poor at around age 40, okay, you would live 23 years less than somebody who says my health is excellent. Wow. This simple question, it is, it is as if we had some sort of barometer inside, <laughs> some sort of capacity like many animals have to follow magnetic north. Okay? This question, again, which has a very strong cognitive component, allows us to sum up, to summarize a lot of things that are happening inside our bodies, including, you see, predicting the results of more than 50 blood tests. Wow. And this question alone, okay, if you say my health is negative, 
can predict whether you are going to end up in an emergency room, whether you are going to use uh, healthcare services more than other people, whether you would be able to survive cancer. And in many cases, it can predict those things better than we physicians. Okay? So we went beyond just asking that question. And we asked people, why do you consider your health to be positive or negative? Okay? And that's where the surprise started to, to emerge. Most people told us that they were feeling healthy, not because of having doctors or taking medication or having tests done in labs. They were describing in more than 90% of cases that they were experiencing a positive health because they had good connections with loved ones, because uh, they felt calm, even though they were facing bigger, okay, big challenges, okay? They had purpose and meaning in their life. And then we went beyond that because we wanted to pay a lot of attention to those who said that their health is negative. And, uh, and again, more than 90% of them, when we asked them, what would you need for your health to become positive? They also gave us reasons that are not medical. They said, well, I need to solve a financial problem. That's the main reason why I am uh, uh, experiencing negative health or I'm having some crisis in my family or my job is not fulfilling anymore. Hmm? You see, these things that basically emphasize that health is a plural thing. Yeah. And this doesn't mean that medicine is useless. Quite the opposite. Medicine plays a huge role in our health, especially when we rate it as negative and when we have something that could be diagnosed or treated by medical professions. Of course, but in this case, um, it's you're relating to us that basically it's more important how we perceive ourselves and how all of this um, mixes together. So basically, do you believe that mental health and cognitive health can influence this physical health that we have? Well, one of the main insights uh, that we gain through this process, which we had before, but we discovered even more pieces of science and more vignettes and, and, and incredible stories from people. Because we looked at data from millions of people from around the world. Is that everything is intertwined. We are not robots that have a physical component on one side and then we have our mental or psychological life separately and then our social okay, interactions in another box. We are intertwined. Yeah. And, um, and uh, let me give you a, a couple of examples of what we found backed by science, we seem to have another sense, okay? In addition to sight and hearing and all that, okay? <laughs> we have other senses. And one of them is called self-perception. We have the capacity to watch ourselves. Right now, for example, okay? I can watch myself speaking with you. And those who are uh, watching us or watching this uh, conversation and listening to it, would also have the opportunity to see themselves watching themselves yes. in this. So to, to sum it up, we are what we believe we are. This is very <laughs> cognitive. Yeah? Yeah. So if we watch ourselves, if we watch ourselves being healthy, and this has been proven with generosity, with giving things to others, uh, or being responsible. If you watch yourself uh, being responsible or being generous or being healthy, you end up okay, mm -hmm. being generous, being responsible and being healthy, okay? Because what we witness ourselves doing has a huge impact on, on what we believe we are and what we end up being or end up becoming. So if you imagine yourself or witness yourself behaving as somebody who is adapting to the challenges that life is presenting to you, then you are healthy. And this is manifested in uh, what is known as rational optimism. Okay. If you have a positive outlook to life, you're facing a major disease, okay? And, and uh, this could be uh, cancer, okay? and you have an optimistic attitude, and you watch yourself being optimistic and positive, well, it has been shown 
that uh, you would survive on average six months longer than somebody who has a pessimistic outlook and pictures themselves as dead or suffering yeah. or not surviving the cancer experience. So yes, and yes, and yes, our mental capacities, our cognitive functions can have huge impact on our physical health. And, and the other way around, it works as well. So uh, we call it the TSL, the toxic stress load. <laughs> and this is the term we use to capture the scars, the, the baggage that we accumulate through our lives as we respond to, to these challenges and, and the price that we pay to respond to the challenges. So, for example, you're worried at work or you have a family uh, disagreement that is bothering you. Okay, that's the challenge. Then at night, you find yourself awake thinking about what happened during the day, what may happen the next day. You stop eating healthy food. You start indulging and eating a lot of junk. You exercise less because you are running around doing other things. And guess what? That has a huge impact even on your chromosomes, on your genetic material. It seems to shorten your tel telomeres and it's equivalent to rapid aging. Mm. So if, if, if the anxiety and the stress that challenges produce to you, okay, uh, accumulate because you are struggling to adapt to them, this okay, will shorten your longevity and it results in changes in your heart arteries, the arteries in your brain, your, the way in which your body manages sugar. So the chances of developing diabetes, heart attacks, strokes increase. Again, another example of how our cognitive mental functions can impact our physical health. Of course, they, they, what you're saying is that they're basically all interconnected and one it works one way or the other. So our mental health and cognitive health affect our physical health and our physical health can also be detrimental to our mental and cognitive health. Yeah, if you're in pain, if you're in pain from a physical challenge, it will definitely affect you of course. mentally and yeah. emotionally and cognitively, you see. Completely. If you have a big lump, if you have a big, big cancer pressing on another organ or an organ, then, okay, you will have, so we are intertwined. It, it will affect your relationships. Yeah. Hmm? If you have a, a dysfunctional relationship, it will affect you emotionally. It will increase your TSL, your toxic stress load, and it will end up producing physical problems. It makes all the sense in the world. And do you think that Cognifid can help in this overall um, general health of the person? Well, the key is in the word that is at the heart of the new approach to health, which is adaptability. Mm. And adaptability is a capacity. It's the capacity that we have to um, change actively in response to, to the challenges that inevitably we face through our lives and thrive and become stronger. That's crucial, you see. It's change in response to challenges that enable us to thrive okay, and to become stronger. So by improving our cognitive functions, then our ability to adapt is bound to increase and hence, you see, our health. So, so would improve. So uh, Cognifid, by the way in which it taps into so many of our cognitive processes, has tremendous potential to increase our adaptability and through that allow us to live a long and healthy life. Well, this, this is so enriching and it's a great way to look at health and a, a very innovative and, and a, a way to look at health in a in a completely different way, because right now we always focus on the medical part of health and not how all of this is intertwined. Um, and Dr. Haddad, if you were to give one piece of general advice about health and healthy lifestyle, what would that be? That you are incredibly well equipped to be healthy. If you understand that health is the ability to adapt, that we are capable of overcoming practically any obstacle that prevents us from uh, changing 
in response to the challenges that life presents to us, that our default is to adapt rather than not to adapt, hmm? that we um, can, in a way, rest easy, okay? Because we as, hum as humans seem to have evolved to uh, be good at how to deal with adversity rather than at the what exactly to do when we face a specific challenge. You see, this is one of the things that seem to make us special as human, okay? that rather than, than be uh, uh, um, equipped to deal with specific changes or specific challenges, we are uh, amazing at changing in response to change itself. Okay? And that, in, in, in a way, uh, made us uh, sum up our main message in, in the sense that, uh, in this way, you are a formidable marvel, okay? <laughs> and that you should uh, feel confident that whatever life presents to you, you're more likely to be all right than not. Oh, wow. That was just amazing. Um, thank you so much. This is an amazing book and you're giving us access to so many actionable insights on how to live a healthy and long life, no matter what, and how this is much in our hands as, as much as we can. And we have control over what we do to be healthy. So thank you very much for this book. Thank your daughter from our part. Um, we absolutely recommend this book. And if you have the chance, please check it out. We'll live, we'll leave the link below so you can ask, you have, you can have access to it. Thank yeah. you so much. And it, it has been, yes, it has been a wonderful adventure for us and, and a great privilege to, to have been able to, to sum up, to distill and to make available so many lessons from so many people uh, from so many regions of the world uh, that could be very actionable uh, in our own lives when we face these inevitable challenges that life will present to us and, and how to be healthy uh, no matter what. Well, absolutely. Very thankful for this enriching experience. And I can't wait to have access to the book live and read it completely. So thank you very much. Thank you again.